everybody. It is Thursday, April the 21st. I am John Pollock alongside Wei Ting with your post-daily news show. Wei, if Netflix contacted you right now and said, no more password sharing, would you sign up for Netflix immediately? Uh, would I sign up for pa uh, Netflix? I mean, I probably would. Yeah, yeah. I mean, depends how much it was, honestly. But um, I, I think I would keep it around it's 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 a it's a good value but also, also i'm somebody who you know doesn't necessarily have to uh worry about a whole lot of other bills related to children and and all that so i don't know everybody's going to be a bit different but what about you john um yeah so i i've got like a, like a plan where we have like multiple uh accounts so i i cannot even say if i'm like skirting the system or not like i was under the impression that this is you can have multiple accounts like they you can yeah i mean the idea is that you, you have them all within the same household i think that's the idea okay well <laughs> i mean come at but me. i mean they've um, never explicitly <laughs> said and i think they are still operating under the impression that yeah a good amount of their audience is probably subscribing across multiple households um i would say most likely i would then continue with netflix if they made it like you can only have like one account per household and you cannot uh, you cannot share. I probably would, but it is interesting to look at. I, I'm blown away by just the reaction to the, this Netflix story. And did, did you see CNN, CNN Plus is shutting down today, like a month after this thing launched. And they put a uh, hundred million dollars in like development into this service, launched it for a month. They're shutting it down. There were 500 people that were working on CNN Plus and just a month in they're like, Let's get let's get out. Check, please. What, what I don't even know what CNN Plus is. It's it, what just this was like their their spinoff, like a like a direct to consumer service that CNN was offering. They weren't putting like just the channel verbatim on. They were creating new programming uh, for CNN Plus. That's my understanding. I don't even think this was available in Canada. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And yeah, I mean, I, I read a little bit about its its launch and uh, some viewer dissatisfaction just to what was on there. But they were taking some of their major personalities and trying to extend it to a direct to consumer model. But I mean, a month in, they're just looking at this and just saying, we're, we are not continuing this any longer. This also was something that got pushed in before the merger went through just mm. recently. So this is, is probably a, as well a response to kind of the the overall guidance now of uh, Discovery uh, or Warner Brothers Discovery. Yeah, that was my next question. You know, I mean, it, it does seem kind of redundant to operate your own streaming platform when it seems like everything under the Warner Dis Discovery umbrella will probably be together in the same thing. So um, yeah, it, it continues to be a big topic of discussion um, in, in, in the years ahead, the streaming wars. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this more with Brandon Thurston on Friday, uh, a man that is a, a Netflix stockholder. Uh, so he he had a rough week, but we will uh, we will talk to him tomorrow about the future of streaming. Brandon will give us all the answers. Where is streaming going? Where's cable? Is cable going to be gone in 10 years away? I say no. I say a hard no on that. I say hard, a hard no as well, because I took a look at some of those uh, HBO uh, uh, our revenue uh, split and a good chunk of it is still coming from DVD sales. So there are people that are out there that are very reluctant to change their old habits. And I, I do think cable's here to stay. Do you know what I saw today? Just scrolling on Twitter. Like I always see impact wrestling promoting like their pay-per-views are available on DVD. Today yeah. I'm scrolling down and available to purchase is last year's bound for glory on VHS. And what? I don't know if they are just like having fun with this, but like it was not presented as like some some comedy tweet either. It's like, here's the VHS you can buy. And I can only fathom that they must sell some of these VHSs to people that makes it worth even the the, uh, you know, manufacturing of such media in this day and age. But I could not in a million years imagine buying a VHS today. I, I wouldn't have any utilization for it. I I, I don't even have a DVD player, John. You know, I don't even have a Blu-ray player at this point. So um, other than, I don't know, some be, maybe some people prefer just the tactile feeling of like rewinding. If there's and, uh, one person out there that has bought an Impact Wrestling VHS, or you know what, <laughs> any VHS in the last year, I would love to hear. Like a new VHS, okay? Not like, a, oh, I was going through a, a garage sale and there was a uh, an old, uh, I don't know, Baby Blue VHS, the best of, best of hits from City TV on. Yeah. How many Greg Turkingtons are out there? Um, yeah. I don't know. 
lots of questions about VHSs and its uh, relevancy today, but nonetheless, impact on, on top of that market. Uh, let's get into some of the uh, news items. Coming out of Wednesday, we got the announcement of the AEW New Japan Pro Wrestling Forbidden Door pay-per-view coming up on Sunday, June the 26th. The Forbidden Doorway, you are going to hear this term over and over. Um, following, to me, really in the spirit of old TNA shows of pay-per-views that could also double as porn titles. Ooh, the Forbidden Door. Hmm, interesting. Get it like on if this were on traditional pay-per-view and someone's scrolling through, you're thinking porn if you're not a wrestling fan. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe. The Forbidden you know, Door. Oh my God, thirty-four ninety-five. I listen. I'm, I'm so conditioned to to these things being very interchangeable at this point that uh, I I don't think twice about it. The Forbidden Door. It's a term that I felt like you know certainly by the time Cody showed up on WWE that we were completely done with. But nope, it, it's it's got a brand new lease, and you know what? Maybe this will even become an annual thing, and it'll be with us forever this term. Do you like how the two O's are the opening of a door? I oh, very clever. That. Yeah. Did not notice that. Uh, I did notice, however, the very blatant, I would say, Doctor Strange um, uh, portal here. Mm-hmm. That we got this, we get to see. So uh, very interesting. Yes, the, uh, the Pro Wrestling Multiverse coming together on uh, June the 26th. They will be at the United Center in Chicago, Illinois. As you can see on the graphic there, tickets going on sale May the 6th. And I guess, obviously, the, the follow-up will be when we get a rollout of match announcements and when they can make those match announcements when both sides have uh, pay-per-views or, or big events coming up. You have uh, Double or Nothing at the end of the month. New Japan has uh, Wrestling Don Taku, followed by the Super Juniors, and then Dominion at the beginning of June. So you have all of that. And I, w- I would say we probably have tickets go on sale without a card. But um, mm-hmm. the idea of waiting till, till Dominion to announce, like that's to me way too small a window to announce your, your big matches. You're talking like a two-week lead up at that point if you're waiting all the way until Dominion. But that's been the, the history of New Japan whenever they have come over here is late match announcements because you have ongoing events to promote and results that matter. Yeah, certainly. But again, I I think it's very much a show that sells itself based on concept and more importantly, probably based on um, the roster that's scheduled to appear. So even if New Japan doesn't exactly have the the champions uh, all set up or the matches even completely set up, I think at at the very least they could announce who will be scheduled to make an appearance. And uh, on the AEW side of things, maybe a bit more room uh, to, 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 to give you your your as much of a card as you can yes so uh I, I i do expect that this is probably going to be you know aew kind of testing the waters of expanding its number of pay-per-views uh takami obari uh spoke to uh justin barrasso at si.com and he was asked the question that, that we were uh discussing on wednesday night about the fact that um will there be female talent on the show given that new japan does not have female wrestlers and specifically the stardom question and you know obari's response was very much that this is a new japan aew show but to never say never in the future about some involvement of an aew stardom kind of uh whether it be a one-off event uh, of their own but um yeah it will be interesting to see if there's any aew women itself on the show that you just do uh, aew matches Mm-hmm. yeah yeah, for a show like this, um, I mean, I, I think with double the size of the rosters, you're probably not going to be struggling to find enough stars to fit on, on the show, even without, you know, an AEW Women's Championship title defense or appearance from Britt Baker or something. But I would certainly hope that there's at least some involvement w- with that roster. Um, but yeah, I, I, either way, the, the it seems like the, you know, over the past 24 hours, the expectation and the promise is that we're going to get crossover matches and not necessarily just like, you know, the G1 Supercard matches taking place by each promotion individually um, on just what just happens to be compiled on the same card. And, you know, uh, with so much, I I think, lowered expectations coming off of the NOAA New Japan shows. Uh, I, people are going to want, you know, some substantial dream matches up and down this card. Do you see an immediate sellout for this show? Immediate. Um, like first weekend. I'll say first weekend. First weekend. Hmm. With and, and I'll, I'll I'll add the caveat that we go with the impression that you have no matches announced by May six, and it's just tickets going on sale. You're selling this concept, and it's you know thirteen, fourteen thousand tickets you're trying to push. I'm going to say no. 
but I think it'll eventually sell out. I think it's going to be very healthy start. I'd mm -hmm. be mildly surprised if it, if, it, if it is an immediate sellout. That would be an enormous boost of confidence in the concept itself, which, which sometimes, I mean, the Noah New Japan show, that was, that sold out very quickly. It was, and that was one that, you know, did not have match announcements uh, ahead of time. And that's why there was a bit of a letdown when the matches were out uh, with this one. You know, if it is that first day sell it, it'll tell that this, this is a very strong concept to your audience that is willing to travel as well. I would expect that there's a first day sell out. It means that there's going to be a lot of travelers for this show. Yeah, I think audiences in North America aren't really strangers to even seeing, you know, the occasional New Japan star pop up on one of these shows, whether it be, you know, formerly with Ring of Honor or, uh, or, or a strong show or New Japan running the, their shows themselves. So I think the novelty of just simply having New Japan in America is not there at all. Um, the novelty will be to see what matchups that we're going to get if and, and perhaps you know your diehards are going to buy first day your diehards who want to make a trip out to chicago to watch a big professional wrestling show are going to going to buy first day but to get everybody involved to fill this place i think you're going to need something a bit more can't miss completely attractive like you know a, a dream match um that they have to announce uh for the top of the card uh, so we move over to our next story, and that is the settlement involving IWTV and Game Changer Wrestling. Uh, there was a lawsuit filed last June by IWTV uh, alleging breach of contract after they entered into a deal with Game Changer back in March of 2020 uh, to be their streaming carrier. And then in December of 2020, uh, this is outlined in the suit that GCW informed IWTV that they were looking at alternative platforms and would move their shows uh, to Fight TV, beginning uh, with a show December the 5th and would run 36 events on Fight until there was a filing. And the deal with IWTV had called for one live event per month and they had structured it. If you missed an event one month, then you do two uh, the, the following month. And they also alleged that GCW disclosed the terms of the agreement uh, to third parties. And then they filed a lawsuit in the, uh, the Middle District Court of Pennsylvania. And then you had GCW filing a motion to dismiss. IWTV requested that that be denied. So this was just ongoing um, back and forth between them as IWTV was uh, seeking a trial. And then we got the announcement. Uh, from both sides, and I thought it was interesting to look at both of these. I won't go through the the entirety of each statement, but we'll start with the Game Changer one. It came out first, stating it was, pleased to announce that we have come to terms on a settlement agreement with IWTV that brings an end to litigation between the parties. The agreement represents a significant milestone for GCW, but most importantly serves as a victory for independent wrestling and its fans. The agreement also affirms our long-held belief that GCW is the sole owner of our extended library, which includes all Game Changer Wrestling, Jersey Championship Wrestling, and LA Fights events. This is important not just for GCW, but for independent wrestling promotions across the U.S. and abroad as we all navigate the ever-changing landscape of pro wrestling. Further, this agreement removes obstacles that had previously limited our ability to capitalize on our content and clears the way for us to move forward with ambitious plans to change the game in 2022 and beyond. Most importantly, the settlement allows us to focus all of our efforts and resources on what matters, producing and delivering the best product possible for our rapidly growing and global fan base. Finally, while this agreement defines a conclusion to our relationship with IWTV, it doesn't mean it's the last time you'll see GCW on the platform. As part of this arrangement, GCW will provide IWTV with... The Settlement Series, a series of eight live events spanning the course of the next year. We look forward to announcing dates and details on these events in the coming weeks. The last year has been trying. As a small business, our resources are not unlimited. Litigation was a last resort, but a necessary step in establishing our independence. At the end of the day, we thrive in the arena, and our resources are best directed towards the ring, not the courtroom. And then IWTV uh, put out their statement, uh, which was a bit different. IWTV is pleased to announce it has settled its lawsuit with GCW. The settlement verifies IWTV's contention that GCW should be held accountable to the agreement which they had previously signed with IWTV. The lawsuit was, in bold letters, never over ownership of the video footage, as IWTV partners can attest. The IWTV agreements clearly state that the promoters retain all rights, title, and interest to the programs. Rather than continue to waste time and money on legal fees, which could be better spent on Boosting independent wrestling and our independent wrestling partner promotions, IWTV has agreed to accept a series of eight GCW live events, which will be shown exclusively on IWTV, as well as distributed on DVD and Blu-ray via Smartmark Video. IWTV wants to make this take this moment to thank its fans and partner promotions for staying loyal to independent wrestling and to IWTV during this period. With this distraction finally removed, we now look forward to years of streaming the best of independent wrestling from our partner promotions and then plugging. 
Seven live streams this weekend, beginning on Thursday. So uh, there we go. Two, uh, two statements that uh, essentially state we have reached the settlement. Uh, they seem to have a, a, a disagreement over whether this was, was or was not uh, regarding any uh, ownership. But I will say this, that uh, this to me for, for either side, um, I do agree in the sense that uh, ongoing litigation and legal fees for companies of this size uh, makes no sense for either one. Um, GCW is a private company, so we can't speak to their finances. But I mean, IWTV was seeking like $500,000 in damages. And to go through all of that, um, would you even be able to recoup that from a company the size of GCW at the end of the day? A settlement seemed um, the most reasonable outcome. I will say, I don't think you have to be um, to be able to uh, decode here the fact that there is contention here. And at the end of it, we're going to work together on these eight events over the next year. And um, if that brings about any issues over, you know, what, what the quality of the cards are, what side wants what, um, that can be very difficult when you have been dealing with months of this back and forth um, going the legal route. And now we're going to uh, collaborate for eight shows coming out of it. But I think this is probably the best scenario for, for both sides of what you could reasonably expect to get something meaningful out of this uh, lawsuit. Well, even even in a settlement, even when it seems like everything is kosher between both sides, uh, we, we still get a bit of a fling of mud here in these very official looking statements. And that to me, just as a spectator, is a lot of fun to to observe uh, and never think, underline bold. Yeah. And I think true to, of course, you know, GCW's um, uh, ethos. Um, taking really every opportunity to try to you know be very uh self-referential and and to kind of make fun of the situation by calling the series of of events the settlement series and not for a second do i think that they'll you know uh, half acid with these cards i mean they have their own reputation to to put out there they're still and and tickets to sell like this like there's no money being exchanged here and these settlement series like it my understanding is that gcw like they will be the ones with the expenses of putting on a live event and selling tickets like that selling tickets is still uh their bread and butter along with streaming but um yeah i i I don't expect that but as we can always see like um you know when you have two sides there can always be in wrestling uh contentious issues over you know myriad issues yeah yeah it's in some ways like it 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 adds to you know perhaps how um i don't know how how, how audiences may, may see them as a, as a group of rebels who uh, reluctantly, I suppose, are, are yeah, taking their punishment, but doing it without going down uh, completely just, you know, w- without making a comment, a, a wisecrack, or, or perhaps. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's exactly hard to say exactly who was in the right or who was in the wrong here, but it seems to me at least IWTV had a reason to go after GCW. And... Uh, I, I, you know, they probably come out of this looking more like the bad guys being the ones, the aggressors in, in, in starting the lawsuit. But to me, it seems like they were completely within their rights. If you, if you have a contract and you, you feel it's been violated, then you have that, that right. And, and a court's going to decide if you, if you were in the right or not. And unfortunately it's such a financial burden to get to that point that, often you know when, when you're talking about like it just did not make sense for either of these companies to go through that uh for for months and months and just pile up uh legal fees um uh, that that's going to you know handicap both sides uh moving forward with this so yes we get the uh the settlement series do you remember when, when brock lesnar finally got free of that wwe non-compete his finisher in new japan oh what was it what did he call it the verdict <laughs> lovely so <laughs> Brock turned out okay after that, but that was uh, maybe the low point of his uh, pro wrestling career. Uh, We continue on with uh, NXT numbers from Tuesday night. So the show was down in viewership uh, to a seven-week low, 569,000 viewers, and a .12, 161,000 viewers in the 18 to 49 demo. So up up by a a small amount, up by 7% from last week, but still their third lowest uh, demo number of the year. This, again, going against the NBA. Um, what was interesting was that their uh, female viewership uh, was up dramatically. Both women 18 to 49 and women 18 to 34. This was the highest watched episode since January 25th. So there was something about the um, 18 to 49 female viewership that um, certainly responded to this episode. Hmm. Maybe some Joe Gacy fans. Could be. Um, I, I, um, 
I, I have no idea. Could it be the NBA effect? Could it be? I I, I, sh- I, sh- <laughs> I I can't imagine it's anything actually on the show that somehow would would skew the female audience that much more. Yes, they finished uh, 44th among uh, cable originals. Um, have you been watching any of Young Rock? Do you watch Young Rock, period? I have not seen a second of Young Rock, other than what the preview that they showed. But um, I know it that is not did... It is not doing well, numbers-wise. I, I keep up with Young Rock. It's, um, I don't think it's a great show. Um, it's kind of a, a half... It, it's really... It's like 22 minutes. It's a very quick watch. It's um, sometimes... I don't know. What, what's interesting is that I never hear any wrestling fans talk about Young Rock. And here it is, a network show that is built around, you know, very familiar wrestling characters. Some played well, some not so well. And yet I, I never hear any talk about Young Rock among people. And we're very much in the bubble. And I just, I never see people talk about Young Rock. Yeah, uh, to be quite honest, like I haven't really watched a dramatized professional wrestling series since uh, Glow. Glow. You know, and I, I, I heard so much more about Glow. Like, and maybe it was just um, that audience was more attached to it. But I sensed like there there was so much more like reactionary pieces and just opinions on Glow than there there ever is on Young Rock. And maybe Young Rock like there isn't a whole lot to talk about. Like you can go into some of like the historical inaccuracies on the show, but it is a dramatized version of pro wrestling. It's not going to be following the letter of of history to a T. To be honest, I heard as much about heels. On a much smaller platform than, than I do about Young Rock, and maybe maybe it tells you tells you something about perhaps the, just the quality of the show, or maybe just the the, the, the demographic of, of a Young Rock versus you know some of these other shows. I don't know if Young Rock is necessarily catered to the hardcore wrestling fan. There's no promotion of it on Raw. Like it's not like it's in the NBC family, but you don't see any crossover. They do not promote the series. Um, mm-hmm. It's just it's very very um, separate, and that's even with like. They're very much like involved in this show. I, I I just think we need to use Young Rock more as a way to to build to this WrestleMania match next year. Well, that's that was the most that we have ever ever seen. At least shows like the audience does does follow the pulse of Young Rock when that that one comment was made uh, last week. Uh, let's continue on. Uh, next up, we're going to chat about uh, wrestling Dontaku. They uh, coming out of Wednesday show in the main event tag. Yo pinned Hiromu Takahashi, and that has now uh, led to a singles match, a challenge being accepted. So that has been added to the card that is happening at the Fukuoka Pepe Dome on Sunday, May the 1st. Can we keep up with all of these big events that that are coming up? Uh, This will feature uh, Okada Naito in the main event for the IWGP title, Tanahashi Tanahashi and Osprey for the vacant U.S. title, El Desperado against Taiji Ishimori, Tamatonga challenges Evil for the never openweight title, a three-way for the IWGP tag titles uh, with Cobb and Great Okan defending against Yoshihashi and Goto and Bad Luck Fale and Chase Owens. Master Wato and Ryusuke Deguchi defending the tag titles, uh, the junior tag titles against Yoshinobu Kanemaru and Doki. Tangelo against Yujiro and then um, Hiromu against Yo. And then we'll have a, a opening uh tag match i believe they will change it to uh once mm. you eliminate uh Hiromu from this but yeah tatsumi fujinami will be teaming with uh shingo takagi in that opener so um the pay pay dome boy I, I love it great name for it um yeah the show looks good but to, to be quite honest like i'm i'm i'm, I'm not that interested in in, in new japan uh, all that much until they start to really expand th- these rosters to include some of the possibility that that's out there I would think at, either at this show or right around this time, we'll probably get the announcement of the the lineup for the best of the Super Juniors. And mm. I'm interested to see what that lineup is. And if it's, um, you know, you, you've seen certain wrestlers like retweeting news about the best of the Super Juniors. So there's a lot of speculation about uh, what talent will be involved in the Super Juniors. And I think there is a heightened expectation for that lineup as a precursor to the summer's G1 to kind of liven things up on the New Japan front. Again, these shows, they're they're very good, but as we talk about, like just being very good wrestling shows on paper, I think you need that spark when we talk about all these big events coming up that, you know, you have to really have something that's an attraction that you want to go out of your way to see. And we'll see if this card uh, ends up having it. Like Tanahashi Osprey should be fantastic. Uh, Okada Naito, I think will be very strong, but we will see. Uh, I know you will make time for Evil and Tamatanga. Um, sure. Tamatong has been very good in this this babyface role, so mm-hmm. um, we will see. I wouldn't I wouldn't mind if we uh, we get the title off Evil and go with Tamatonga in a different direction with this never title. Uh, I just wanted to quickly make mention of uh, the PFL, which uh, launched its season on Wednesday night. So, 
in this offseason, they signed a new deal with ESPN. So there's going to be several cards this year on ESPN proper, as well as ESPN2. They also re-signed Kayla Harrison, who had interest from the UFC and interest from Bellator. So they made some big moves. I think the concept is finally resonating with people. They had a pretty well-received season uh, last year. It's The way this works is that you have your tournaments in each weight class and you'll fight several times during the regular season. You get three points for a win and then you can get up to three additional points if you finish someone in the first round, two points in the second round, one in the third. So you could get as much as six points and then you have your playoff season. And it's not as complicated as it sounds with uh, doing the math. And their their season opener featured, uh, I have not seen the main event yet, but people were just... uh, clamoring for this this main event as a fight of the year contender uh, with Jeremy Stevens, who had been fighting in the UFC for the last 14 years, making his debut and losing to Clay Collard in the main event. So that means Clay Collard gets uh, three points for the decision victory. And then the, the rest of the card, uh, featured uh, Rosh Manfio, who was the lightweight winner last season. Uh, he got a victory. Antonio Carlos Jr. got a first-round submission, so he got six points. It was uh, divided up between lightweights and light heavyweights for the first week. And uh, they'll come back next week, but the the big one is in two weeks when Kayla Harrison will fight. The downside is that PFL just does not have much for Kayla Harrison in terms of, like, big competition for her and that's kind of the drawback is that you know financially this was a great deal for her to stay with pfl but the the elusive fight is the hope of doing something interpromotionally with bellator to do kayla harrison and chris cyborg but that it, it's difficult when you're talking about uh, multiple promotions but that's the latest on the on the pfl uh, i enjoy following the pfl uh, especially on dvr where the the in-between downtime is uh reduced when you can just fast forward to the uh, next fight as eric marcotte can attest to uh, but that was going down on wednesday night and tonight we have impact it is the go home show before rebellion and they have jay white carl anderson doc gallows and Gr- chris bay taking on matt taven kenny king mike bennett and vincent Eric Young and Joe Doring, the tag champions, taking on Black Taurus and Crazy Steve. Trey Miguel and Laredo Kid against Speedball Mike Bailey and Ace Austin. That should be an entertaining tag match. And before the impact has Rich Swan and Willie Mack taking on Heath and Rhino uh, going into the pay-per-view on Saturday night, which is headlined by Moose defending the impact title against Josh Alexander, which is the, the big match that they have been promoting ever since Bound for Glory, which was an angle you enjoyed, way the way that Alexander won the title and then is celebrating with his child in the ring and Moose cashes in and takes the title. And it's been this long journey for Alexander to get his rematch. And now he has it. So this has been a pay-per-view that or, or a rematch that has been essentially been building since October. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those people who are like me who just kind of dip in and out of impact but happen to catch that closing ankle already kind of have a built-in you know idea of what this story is um are you sensing much buzz for this one um not a whole lot um i think you will you will have your your audience that that watches it but i think it's um i I think it's a company that largely if people find the time they will check in on it but this certainly does not have the feel of impact i I would say even like three years ago it's there's just so much out there Uh, I am going to watch the show on Saturday and I'm going to do a bonus show for cafe members on Sunday uh, going through that if you want to check it out Um, some of the other highlights on the show uh, Chris Saban and Jay White and Steve Macklin are going to have a triple threat match Uh, Deanna Perrazzo defending the Reina de Reina's championship against Taya Valkyrie Tasha Steeles defending the knockouts title against Rosemary Jonah against Tomohiro Ishii which should be um, a great match uh, in the middle of this card Uh, Jonathan Gresham who uh suffered that injury last week during the Battle of the Belts taping. I guess he is uh, he is still listed for this show on Saturday, but I guess uh, to be determined um, if he is cleared and can wrestle uh, Eddie Edwards on this show. And then you have on the undercard, Trey Miguel, Ace Austin, and Speedball Mike Bailey for the X title and the influence against the inspiration for the Knockouts World Tag Team titles. And that is coming up this weekend. Not, not, the, uh, not the busiest weekend uh, coming up. Do you have plans this weekend, Way? I might catch this F1 race that's happening on Sunday morning, John. Where is at 9 it? 9 a.m. Uh, I believe in Monza, Italy. Monza. Okay. Yeah, Monza. Who is, uh, is this, where are we at the season? Are we at the... I'm not caught up yet. So, like, I, I think I saw one race without really completely knowing. I'm not caught up in all the standings and, and whatnot, but um, uh, I don't know. Uh, you're, a, you're a Lewis Hamilton it. guy, aren't you? 
Not so much, dude. No. Oh, okay. No, no. Um, I'm 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 more likely to cheer for the underdog. I mean, what I really am, and I know we've talked about this privately, John. I'm a, uh, uh, what's his name? Gunther Daniel Steiner. Ricardo? Oh <laughs> no, him. I'm a Gunther Steiner guy. Gunther Steiner. This guy's the best. He's the best. Like if you're watching F1 Drive to Survive, um, despite never being close to being top five, even. Uh, the engineer uh, and, and and manager of the the Haas team uh, is just he's the he's the best character on the show. He's just like you know perennial like how do I keep my job? You know, uh, Dude, he's, this, he's the best. Like honestly, I I always look at um, especially in the UFC like the the stress of being a fighter in the UFC where you can. I mean, the, the amount of dedication it takes. And you can be cut off of one loss. That's it. In F1, like we're talking, there's 20 seats. There are 20 seats. And these guys that can just get bumped at, at like the end of a season. Like it, the stress is just unbelievable. And this guy totally. is a walking embodiment of stress. Um, I also enjoy um, the dual press conferences we got in season one with uh, Cyril from... Uh, uh where, where is he from renault renault and yeah. the, the dude from red bull as they're in business together where he, uh uh <laughs> renault provides the engine is the engine maker for red bull and then renault <laughs> steals daniel ricardo from them oh it's incredible it's yeah, unbelievable the, the politics are amazing my yeah, god absolutely. this would be like a um WWE <laughs> is providing AEW with like a broadcaster, yeah. and then they also take Cody Rhodes from him. Uh, it, it's nuts. And it, then it, AEW it, says, we, "We've got another broadcaster now. We, we're going to go with Honda." It, or it'd be like you know, like a TV station broadcasting out of a, a a master control, and then that master control is starting their own competitor yes. uh, with the same content. <laughs> so. I'm just going to put put this out there. I am not guaranteeing this, but I'm going to try my damnedest to catch up. And by the time we get to season five is the next one of Drive to Survive. Yes. Me and Way are going to do something regarding season five of Drive to Survive. Ooh. That okay. is my hope. Because I'm as, I am as in as... I don't think I'm in to the extent you are. Like you you have dove in uh, to, to a larger degree, but I'm on my way. I am on my way. I love You'll this series. You'll get there, John. I'm, I'm amazed at like how many people this series has converted to actually being at, at all in, involved and interested in, in, in a sport and, and when i'm talking people talking about people in my life who aren't typically interested in sports at all so. ultimate fighter is the comparison everyone makes mm-hmm. i can honestly say objectively this is a better series than ultimate fighter like i think if you were to go back and watch season one of ultimate fighter granted it was 2004 that that was filmed mm-hmm. in and 2005 we're talking about just a difference in technology and certainly in a budget for such a series but to me this is the superior series. It, it really is just fantastic sports storytelling that I think will grab anybody in into it, whether or not you're a fan of the sport. And, and I wasn't, but now I have become one. We have a few super chats, John. Before I'm we get out of here, I'm going to uh, ask for you to read them just a minute ago, uh, and we will see if any of them are about F1. our favorite sport. No, I don't think so. But we go to Joe from H-Town who sends $5. Thank you for the support, Joe, as always, from H-Town. He says, favorite thing you did in Caliway, and when and where will you be headed on your next vacation, John? Well, I'll start first. Uh, favorite thing I did in California, I, I got to go to a number of really beautiful beaches uh, just all throughout the coast, whether it be in San Diego or up the Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, we drove as far as Malibu, and it was just just beautiful, you know, like the... I, I I constantly like drove around and just asked myself, well, why do we deal with this weather in Toronto? Like if 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 we have the possibility of of, of moving anywhere, first of all, West Coast time is great for professional wrestling. Like I wake up and I can see you do one of these live shows, um, and then by the time the evening comes, like even to you know upload the occasional show from the road, like it it worked out perfectly for me. So. I, it, it, you know, someday, John, maybe, maybe you and I will, will consider, uh, a move to the, to the West coast. So that the, probably my, the beaches were my favorite thing. And I also had like wonderful Thai food actually in LA. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Uh, um, my next vacation, I, I have no idea when my next vacation is. I actually am taking some time off in, in July. Uh, we have rented a cottage, uh, in Ontario. 
So I'm going to go do that for a week, but nowhere that I'm getting on a plane. Although, although I am considering looking at, at some of these shows coming up over the next uh, little while of uh, c- considering maybe going to something. Maybe. Have you thought about like how, like, I imagine traveling with children itself. I mean, never mind pandemic, of course, but like just even like the hassle of like carrying all the stuff you need oh, it's, to travel um, with children. That's the thing. It's, a- uh, I don't know if it really, it, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a whole nother deal of the idea of getting on a plane and flying somewhere far with two kids is, um, I, I'm not exactly uh, holding my breath for that. Cause like I'm, cause I'm, I'm, I'm boarding these planes and I, I'm seeing people like bring their strollers. They're like, even like the strollers that you could fold up and put into a bag, like all this extra shit that you got to lug around just to try to get, get this infant on board. Uh, it's crazy. So some, some day soon, John, I hope you, you get some time off. All right. We got a Jake from the Windy City who sends $5. He says, welcome back. Did you get some in and out burger on your trip? Yes, I did, Jake, of course. You know, uh, people who are from out of California who happen to stop in there always have to stop at In-N-Out, and I did as well. That was like your one destination when we went to, one year when we went to Mania, that was like on your hit list that we had to make it to an In-N-Out burger. And I remember we went at like two in the morning or something. was that? Uh, It was, I can't remember which one. It was on some, it might not have even been Mania. I remember we went there at like one in the morning or something, and you wanted to order off the secret menu. Oh, okay. Do you remember this? Might have been Vegas. It could have Actually. been Vegas. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, the menu itself at In-N-Out is only, like, three things. And, I mean, everybody orders. Really, it's just, like, the animal style. Like, I, I like In-N-Out. I think it's a great novelty Any for people who, who travel from out of town. I don't think it's as great as people, you know, seem to, to make it um, seem. It's, like Tim, it's, it's the Tim Hortons of the U.S., I like it. <laughs> it's it? very comfortable. But am I am I going to say to someone, drop everything what you're doing when you come to Canada and go up Tim Hortons? Like it's coffee, right. but it's it's just coffee. And and nice. what I could say, it's actually a great comparison because what what I could say about In and Out as well as Tim Hortons is that it's great value. You know, for for the price of like I don't know six bucks, you can get a tremendous burger. You can have a very good meal, and just the novelty of ordering something secret, even though mm-hmm. it's not really a secret, is is kind of neat. Um, if you're getting the fries, you don't need the animal style fries. I just, I, I didn't like it. Uh, regular fries is perfectly fine, but the burgers are great. So I, I know people in California kind of hate me um, for not loving it, but there you go. Also, CNN is my default news network, but in terms of streaming, too much out there. That is true, Jake. A whole lot to consolidation. Consume. That's what we're going to see. You know, all these, these streamers. All right, we got a Brandon from New Jersey who says, "Welcome back, Gracie Hunter Way." Uh, oh just yes, for the you, real Brandon. return, the real return. We we just, didn't get the full way experience yesterday, not until the Gracie hoodie is back. I wore this just for you. Uh, and finally, Joe John Pontia sends ten dollars. Thank you very much for the support, John. He says, "Randomly listened to your podcast from uh, October thirtieth, twenty seventeen, last night, which is of course our uh, first show as part of, or at least technically our first show as independents, pre post wrestling." He says, I felt badly about hearing you losing your jobs after 15 years, especially John having a four-month-old. Just wanted to support a few years late. Wow. Well, there Never you go. too uh, late. So um, welcome welcome to 2017. Um, spoiler, it turned out okay. Yes, it did. Thank you very much for your support, John. And, and the four-month-old is now? Four years old. Four years old. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. Appreciate all your support, guys. All right, let's go wrap things up. Uh, waiting, if you have not had enough of waiting, if you have missed him these last uh, week and a half, well, he is back in full force today. He is going to be live in just over an hour's time at 3 Eastern with Jordan Goodman and Damian Abraham for the cannabis edition of the wellness policy. So I look forward to that. And then tonight, MCU later, waiting, WH Park and... Mike Murray discussing episode four, a mind-blowing edition of Moon Knight coming up for Post Wrestling Cafe members. You know, I'll say it's a great one-two punch of podcasts because you can celebrate 421 with uh, Jordan Goodman and Damian Abraham and I at three o'clock and then somehow carry that energy all the way up to, for this edition of Moon Knight, which will certainly take some assistance to try to properly understand and properly get through. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to all of those shows with all of our friends later today. 
And then Wei Ting is going back on vacation tomorrow. I will be here doing the new show live at 1 Eastern with Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics. Uh, we'll go through the Dynamite numbers. Uh, we're going to talk about the future of streaming, and we will have a concrete answer at the end of that show about where cable is going, where streaming is going. We are going to tie all those loose ends up uh, tomorrow live at 1 Eastern. Always fun chatting with Brandon. And do go check out um, his breakdown of AEW's business uh, that he put out on Twitter Um Beautiful looking graph and some really great uh, info and research uh, that probably took him a uh, considerable amount of time to put together. But I always talk about just how eye pleasing his data is when he puts it out there. You know, Brandon's a great follow on Twitter, but uh, he's also a great follow on Instagram as well at WrestleNomics. Um, because, yeah, like you said, John, like the visual nature of everything is, is always top notch. And uh, if you want to even get it on a mug, he's selling one of those too at store.postwrestling.com. With one of right. those lovely so go, graphs. Go support uh, Brandon and Chris, uh, who just put out a bonus show last night as well on their YouTube channel. So there you go. All of that uh, coming up on Friday. Way and I will be back Friday night, 11.05 Eastern, chatting SmackDown and AEW Rampage featuring Tomohiro Ishii and Adam Cole. A very busy week for one uh, for one Thomas Ishii. Mm-hmm. Tom, big Tom. Big as Tom. BD call him. Yeah. All right. That is it, everybody. We are out. Thank you for tuning in for the Post Daily News Show.